Awesome. So good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our second annual alumni panel. Uh, I want to especially thank our panelists tonight for joining us. Welcome back to the Hilltop, um, virtually anyway. And um, I'd like to get started by asking each of you to introduce yourselves um, and tell us what your uh, major degree was in at um, St. Ed's, what your current job is, um, a little bit about what you do and um, when you graduated from St. Edward's. So I'm gonna go across the screen in the order that you appear. So Gilbert would be first. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Gilbert Galindo. I'm based in Austin, Texas. I studied economics and finance at St. Edward's University. I graduated in 2012. Currently, my role is a manager of data analytics for a company called ITRON. And just to put it very simply, um, our team uses technology to help our supply chain solve problems. I think I hit everything. I don't know. I may have missed something. Wait, did you say when you graduated? Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, 2012. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My, my name is Daniel Guerra. I, uh, I graduated in December of 2015 with a degree in uh, business administration. I uh, own and uh, manage two companies, one called Anthology Investments, the other one called Anthology Management. We're a vertically integrated real estate investment firm, uh, particularly specializing in the multifamily space, so apartment buildings mainly in DFW, um, <clears throat> and I'm based in, in Colorado and in Texas, in Dallas specifically. Um, I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Callie. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, um, my name is Kaylee Ridley. I graduated from St. Ed's in 2019 with um, a business admin degree and an English literature degree. Um, I'm currently a course content developer at John Wiley and Sons Publishing, and I work on the accounting and finance uh, textbooks and courseware area. Um, so we do the Wiley Plus course for each textbook and then also the textbook itself. Um, but my job pretty much manages the process of uh, curating all of that and creating those supplements that you use in class and whatnot. Um, that's where I'm at. Jennifer? Uh, my name is Jen. I graduated with class of 2019, technically 2018. Um, I work at Dell here in Austin, Round Rock area. I'm a quality lead, so I oversee the employees who are interacting with commercial businesses to help their tech problems. Thank you. And Jimmy. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, Jimmy Nuri. I was a two-time graduate from St. Edward's, so I graduated with my undergraduate degree in accounting in 2010, and then I stayed along for the uh, Master's of Accounting program, which I completed in 2011. Um, I am currently an associate director at Guidehouse, uh, which is a global consulting firm. I'm currently based in the Washington, D.C. area, um, and I specialize in um, government consulting services, so primarily providing consulting services to the Department of Homeland Security. All right, thank you. Um, so I wanted to, um, there's, there's sort of a common theme um, in, in the work that you do, and that is you all um, either very directly or in Kaylee's case, a little bit more indirectly um, work in the area of technology, analytics. Um, and so I wondered if um, you could tell us a little bit about how, you know, what you learned at St. Edwards prepared you for that, or perhaps did not prepare you things that, you know, you had to learn on the job as you went along, because of course, um, over time, the technology and the analytics um, that we're able to teach our students has really changed and advanced. Um, but given that you all graduated at different times, 
Um, so why don't we start, we'll start with you, Jimmy, since you're um, up. Sure, absolutely. Um, yes, I, I think the biggest thing that that kind of helped me is like the critical thinking skills that that I, I feel like you're, you're kind of taught in just about every class. Um, that with communication skills, I think is is huge and, and key to, you know, being able to gather, you know, I, I work with clients on a regular on a on a more or less daily basis. So I'm, I'm a little bit more client focused, not everybody might be in that realm. But for me, it's it's being able to, you know, gather the requirements from our clients, and then be able to communicate our solutions and our, our path to to do that. So you know, I think all of the courses, you know, from the general business courses do a fantastic job of preparing you with those types of communication skills. They force you to work in groups and teams, which I do on a daily basis as well. And I think, you know, all of those things, I think, coupled together are, you know, great in, in preparing at least me for the work that I am currently doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Daniel, you're nodding your head very actively. Did you want to jump in? Well, uh, I, I, I've met people like Jimmy and, and people like Jimmy are extremely intelligent. Um, I'm very impressed by what you do, sir. Um, but no, uh, I'm not a data guy, uh, or rather the analytics question uh, as, as you were directing it is not really what I do. But um, if anything, what, what St. Edward's prepared me for is, is just the discipline of, of, um, of learning something that, that you did not know prior to doing that. And then, you know, being tested at it and hopefully performing well and really learning to be a learner and embracing that um, things at the beginning are pretty difficult. And that's usually how things are. And, you know, in the real world, you're you're definitely going to be t tested on that. So, I mean, that's that's it. I, I, I got decent grades, but it didn't come naturally. It came, you know, through, through really working hard at it. So that's what I took from it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. How about you, Jen? You work at Dell, um, so it must yeah. be technology. So I forgot to mention earlier, my major was digital media management. Um, I thought that I was going to go into marketing. I was really interested in that, and I, I love, I still love marketing, but I don't do any of that now. Uh, it's all like purely tech and client related. Um, but my education really helped me because you learn a variety of different courses. Like I didn't just stick to marketing. I like the uh, diversity in the digital media management major. Um, so I think it helped me most with adaptiveness. So the type of work that I do, I didn't necessarily have a course for that. Um, but being able to pick up tools and getting your mind ready that technology is always changing. Like even in the last, like three years that I've been at Dell, <laughs> everything, all the tools we use are like completely different now. So just having that mindset and being prepared to like take on different, different topics, different tools, softwares, all of that. Yeah. So I'm hearing a theme that the critical thinking, the learning to be adaptable, and no matter what tool you use in your classes, Sort of translates so learning any tool can help you learn the next tool more easily for sure yeah um kaylee what about you um so you're yeah. kind of combining business and in the accounting finance space mm -hmm. with with textbook publishing and with your your writing background um how do you kind of see that intersecting and what how did your business degree really yeah help so you i i Continued. I initially started St. Ed's at, with a business degree and then switched to a double um, English and business once I decided publishing was the route I wanted to take. And I stuck with my business degree uh, largely because I wanted to be able to uh, speak the language that the people who actually decide what's getting published speak. So how is this going to um, benefit the company? What's the profit? How much is it going to cost us being able to accurately budget? costs and projects and things like that, I wanted that skill set. Um, and I definitely got it at St. Ed's. That skill set has carried me into um, when I was working in editorial at Wiley, and then now I've moved into course content development. Um, all of that, we have to budget how much these projects are going to cost, what we expect the sales to be, and things like that. Um, 
So I'm very comfortable with all of that language and that process, whereas a lot of people who go into publishing don't have that background at all. So that's a very scary hurdle that they have to jump when they start the publishing in the publishing industry. Um, so that was something that I was very comfortable with from the get-go. What I do think in general St. Ed's gave me was the ability to multitask with lots of different projects happening. So I was a double major, so I was taking lots of hours throughout my entire uh, college career. So I was constantly having lots of things up in the air. So now when I'm working on multiple textbooks, multiple projects, it's um, not hard for me to manage all of that and keep on top of everything that I'm having to keep track of and whatever. I'm working with multiple vendors, different softwares, all of that is kind of merging to create this one thing. And we've got deadlines and, and things like that. So I think St. Ed's really prepared me for that kind of fast paced, lots of things happening, lifestyle and, and workload that I'm now dealing with. Um, and then also it's really nice having knowledge of the stuff that I'm working on. Like I'm working on accounting and finance. So even though I was a business admin major, I took basic finance and basic accounting courses. So I have a general knowledge of what's happening. So it's not Greek to me the way it is for some other people who are working on titles and things. Um, so I, I just feel very comfortable in my role, which is nice because it can be a really overwhelming role at our company just because there's so much happening. And speaking to Jen's point with adaptability, we're in the ed tech realm kind of. So with COVID and everything, we had to make a pretty sharp right turn into online learning. Um, we were already headed that way, but it sped up our timeline by like five years or something. So we were having to quickly adapt and figure out the best ways to serve students and professors to make sure they're getting what they need out of their course materials and things like that. So it was a lot of quick learning, um, lots of trial and error, like, oh, we think this would be great. And then we put it out there and people are like, this is not helpful or we don't like it or whatever. Um, so I agree with Jen, just like learning to think on your toes and learn new things really, really quickly and adapt to the uh, situation as it's presented to you. Yeah. yeah. I, and I would imagine with COVID um, these last two years, uh, you really were under even more pressure to adapt quickly. Is that what your experience oh, yeah, has absolutely. been? <laughs> the first like six months of COVID were quite the time at Wiley and all textbook publishers. I mean, because you're helping students go fully online, but also professors and a lot of professors were not online instructors at all. Like had some professors were kind of half and half did some things or whatever, but there were a lot of professors who wouldn't even use Wiley Plus. Like they just wanted the textbook. So we were having to transfer them completely into a Wiley Plus course and give them, we were trying to curate as much material as possible on good instructional design and things like that to provide for professors so that they could adapt and provide their students with the best experience possible given the situation. Um, so yeah, the first six months of COVID were pretty gnarly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for all of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so Gilbert, uh, you work directly in the analytics area. Um, tell us how your finance and econ um, major. Did you take econometrics by any chance when you were here? Because we. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was. Yeah. I was going to mention that. Actually. Okay, uh, great. Well, go ahead so there, and talk. To... Yeah, I would say there's there's two areas uh, that definitely uh, came to mind. First, being very specific, um, the things that I actually learned, and when I think back on what I learned 14 years ago, um, that I still you know withdraw mentally are definitely uh, statistics you know, basic financial and accounting concepts. And obviously uh, coming from a finance uh, background, I am very in tune with the financial health of, of a company and what that means. And surprisingly, that's something that not many people walk into a data analytics role knowing. It's incredibly important to understand what you're doing and where your project is focused on, how ultimately that ties to uh, the financial health of the company. So kind of having all, these, all that type of knowledge in the back of my mind, I think has uh, helped me succeed in my career. Um, it's something that uh, I'm pretty proud of uh, taking away from the university and still and still tap into. Mm -hmm. The statistics piece obviously is very important. 
as concepts like data science um, and analytics uh, increase and, and become more and more needed in firms, it's important to understand how you know things move, patterns and and, and data, and uh, having the techniques and, and and the conceptual understanding of of how to examine those uh, that type of phenomenon is incredibly important as well. Uh, something that I use every day in my job. Um, the second component, though, is you know maybe a little more uh, not as specific, uh, and it definitely uh, elaborates on what everyone has said and mentioned around critical thinking. Uh, Sandez does a really good job of conditioning you to uh, really look at the big picture, uh, really question, and then question further uh, why you're looking at something and when you examine a problem. Uh, in, my in my type of role, and I imagine most others on the call, we deal with a great deal of ambiguity. And I think uh, going through the liberal arts St. Ed's curriculum, um, from the beginning to the end, uh, you're kind of conditioned and set up to be very comfortable um, with handling ambiguity, having a tool, having a mental framework um, to take something that you didn't know, but by the end of it, you become a pretty um, you know, well-versed expert and are able to circulate and share knowledge to others. So uh, those, are, those are the two main areas, I would say, um, to answer your question. As far as something that I didn't learn enough or didn't learn at all, uh, it's probably just specific to the technology. Um, not, not as much programming, um, but that type of stuff is absolutely very, um, if, you, if you are the type of person, you can learn that very, very easily on the job. Most firms, you know, don't, don't weigh that too much uh, as opposed to the other two categories that I had mentioned before. The ability to think, the ability to, to understand the overall picture and how it ties to kind of the financials and operations of the company, so. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly very focused on making sure that our students have Excel skills um, so as a baseline uh, ability with analytics, but you know, bringing in um, a lot of other tools like um, Tableau and uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, Power BI and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, people still use Excel for sure. Uh, yeah. that, I, feel I was like about that to say Excel cool. will be here forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spreadsheets, yeah. Um, so let I want to pivot a little bit to um, talking about um, being involved in, as an undergraduate in uh, student organizations and extracurricular activities. And I know that um, you, Gilbert, and also Jimmy and Haley, at least, um, were involved in, in student clubs. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that experience and how that helped you, um, you know, maybe things that you learned doing that, that you've been able to use in your career path. Um, so let's see, well, um, we'll go ahead and continue with you, Gilbert, and then move on to Kaylee and Jimmy and anyone else that um, on the panel that wants to join in and talk about their experience, feel free to raise your hand and I'll slot you in there. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll be brief. Mine uh, wasn't that involved uh, outside of the economics club, which I helped spearhead uh, with the help of Dr. Clements. Uh, the extent of the, the extracurricular activity was kind of meeting on a monthly basis covering special topics. So there was a, a deal of, you know, researching and um, presenting kind of some facts and sharing that with interested like minded people. Uh, as far as you know what, how that helped me, I think, the you know, um, the idea of organizing, uh, I think it's very important, uh, getting different people in one room and facilitating a meaningful conversation is something that, you know, I do every every day of my job. So uh, I, I absolutely take that away from, from that experience and highly suggest that people get comfortable with that as well. Thanks. How about um, Kaylee? You were in uh, Delta Sigma Pi, right? Yes. Yeah, I am. Uh pledge for uh, the business fraternity Delta Sigma Pi my freshman year. So I was in it all four years of school. Um, and it was a really great opportunity, not only to meet other business people within the business school, people my age, people above me. Um, there was a lot of helpful study tips that went around, just like lots of resources that way, just to, um, help you get through your classes. A lot of times you were in the same classes as other brothers and things like that. So that was really great. Um, but outside of that, we had a lot of opportunities for networking 
in the Austin area and then also elsewhere because we would travel to different conferences and things like that. Um, and so we would meet brothers from other areas and then also bring in professionals from the Austin area um, to have them talk to us about different uh, things regarding various business industries. Like we brought in people in accounting, marketing, um, like all areas of business. It was a really diverse grouping of people that we had in the fraternity in the chapter. So we tried to cater to each um, discipline, if you will. Um, so that was, I think that was probably the most valuable thing from DSP was learning, not just having the opportunity to connect, but learning how to make those connections, how to maintain them, how to be professional in that setting, um, how to communicate via email, phone call, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, we just, we had multiple workshops and things like that um, and, got, and got to practice it, not just like had a workshop and then didn't do it again until we entered the professional world. We did it repeatedly throughout our tenure as brothers and things like that. Um, and then also it's just, I was an officer for three of my four years. So it was just another thing to learn to juggle and manage and um, do time management, but also public speaking, um, communicating with student life and the central office for the fraternity. Um, just reinforcing a lot of the skills that were being taught in class. It was just giving me a way to apply them on a regular basis and um, just a really great way to have a community on campus, friendly faces everywhere, people to say hi to, have coffee with, get lunch, sit on the lawn, whatever. Um, so yeah, and I, I was also on the one of the literary magazines, Arite, um, as a an editor one year that was a lot of fun as well not really applicable here but just <laughs> it is good to get <laughs> involved wherever your interests are yeah. Um, but yeah well I just sent an email to our students the other day um, in the business school asking if they wanted to submit something to Arate so it is applicable <laughs> um, Jimmy how about you uh, you were in the accounting club was yeah so I actually uh, I, I didn't get involved in that until a little bit later so I think I was a junior by the time I got involved and I was a member for a little bit but ended up serving as the vice president I think for either a year or a year and a half I can't remember the exact time frame um, I mean would, would certainly just echo everything that, that Callie said I mean yeah the connectivity I think was huge for me um, I actually met the recruiter that I ended up cold emailing my resume to uh, who at the time worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers and that's how I landed my job and long story short I've been with the same job in the same company for the last you know almost 10 plus years as a result so um, those two like yeah those those types of you know connectivity and networking opportunities cannot be you know overstated um i think the other thing too that i would also um stress was was you know like the leadership of you know having a position or a role like that i think it really does kind of give you some of those you know tools that again that Callie hit on with your public speaking and you know just your comfort level in certain situations and managing you know people and activities and tasks i think that is only going to help you, um, particularly as you're looking to interview. And, you know, it, it always helps to have like an extracurricular activity that you can talk about. So um, everything that she said and, and just highlighting those, uh, those two other things as well. Yeah, and I like that, well, the fact that all three of you took leadership roles, but, but I think it's important to emphasize that if you do decide to um, affiliate yourself with a student organization that you really get involved. That's where you get the benefit of it. Um, just having it as a line item on your resume without anything to talk about that you ever did with the organization isn't really very helpful at all. Um, Daniel and uh, Jen, did either one of you belong to any MSB student orgs or any other extracurricular organizations? Daniel? Um, yes, uh, frankly, no, I was not a part of any club. I dedicated all my time in that school to complete my tasks. And after that, I pursued my own interest in my own time. Uh, that is not to say that I didn't go to, to 
uh, you know, specific lectures or guests that were invited to the school, which were terrific and and very inspiring. Uh, but uh, but as it pertains to you know joining a, a club, no, I, I did not do that. How about you, Jen? Yeah, a lot come to mind. I was very involved, but the specific um, events that I went to, not rather not student clubs, but the events that my professors would tell me like we should go to or maybe made you because of an assignment those have been so helpful to me um like three days startup i don't know if that's still around absolutely yeah. do it um because it made you work with a group of students that you may have never seen before um all maybe not in your classes because you don't have the exact same major but uh it connects you to people makes you build a connection really fast because you have to work together to build something. And then I remember we also went out and surveyed people like at Whole Foods, just out in the open strangers. The uncomfortable tasks are the ones that really like, it's cliche, it's like the uncomfortable things make you grow, but that built up my confidence to have audacity. So I would say like my biggest tips um, in your professional life, networking and having audacity. Like, and I'll give you an example as well. Um, when I was at St. Ed's, I went to the career fair, which again, another thing that you should definitely go to. Um, I went to the booth where I met uh, who would be my first manager at Dell. I was not even going to go up to them. I was not going to apply. I did not think, for some reason, I did not think that I was valuable or worthy enough to be hired there and i met him i you know i ended up applying because of him and i got the job and now i have like a great career here um so it's just like those little things that you may think oh it's so easy to skip or oh i don't really feel like going what's this going to do for me you may not realize it in that moment but years later like you are going to develop skills networking and building rapport with people that's that's huge um, because you can never like really contain all the skills, but maybe the people that you have befriended that really enjoyed working with you, there's people who are happy to connect you and vice versa to other opportunities that you may be looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm happy to, to hear you um, all share how much that helped you. Uh, because, yeah, we're always working hard to encourage our students to attend um, all these wonderful events that we put on. And um, several of you mentioned networking uh, as an important thing, including you, now, Jen. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're launching this year at St. Edwards in the Monday School of Business specifically is a peer mentoring program that pairs up uh, freshman and sophomore students with junior and senior students with the upper class um, members being the mentors and, the, and freshmen and sophomores as mentees. And then, you know, with the idea that those freshmen and sophomores as they advance may become mentors to a new set of mentees. Um, so I wondered if each of you could talk a little bit about your experience with being mentored and or mentoring, um, starting perhaps at St. Edwards, if you had any particular mentors here, um, and then as you started on your career path, um, how mentors um, were helpful to you and how you maybe started to mentor yourself to, for other people. Um, so who would like to start first on that topic? start um if you, daniel if you want to go first that's totally okay no no okay. no 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 please okay um but I, I would say that with the fraternity there was a fair amount of mentorship within that even if it wasn't one specific person like i did have a big sister um but we weren't in the same major so like we connected and talked about other things and it was great to kind of get her perspective on college life and being a business student. But 
um, wasn't super helpful specifically to what I was doing. Um, but within the fraternity, we had lots of like the upperclassmen would help the lower classmen with classes that they were taking. Um, we would kind of group up according to discipline and things like that. Um, like that happened a fair amount and it was great to just have people to um like one thing I think is really valuable with mentorship is someone who is a mentor has either gone through what you've gone through or they have perspective on what you're going through something like that and so they have a bigger picture look so they can encourage you to look at things differently than how you've been looking at it so you might see something one way and you're plowing along on that path but they can kind of say hey like let's take a step back what about this approach or what how how do you think about this problem in regards to this and so they can really encourage you to think differently on a topic I did have an official mentor at St. Ed's but he was for my uh thesis my English literature thesis so a different relationship but he did a similar thing he was a Shakespeare scholar so and I was doing a thesis on Shakespeare so he would be able to give me like I would be on a path and be like okay yeah great take it further take it down this path like what about this road that you could take instead of this one like so I think a mentor offers that really valuable big picture and guiding you into a different perspective than what you're doing now and that's and I have a mentor I guess kind of officially with at Wiley and she does something very similar it's, I go to her with kind of what I'm experiencing and how I'm handling that on my day-to-day -day and the projects that I'm dealing with and she has my goals in mind she knows what I'm looking to achieve and she and I talk and have conversations and she kind of gives me she just encourages me to think think of things differently or if I don't know something if I'm unaware of a resource that's at Wiley that I'm that would solve my problem or would help me solve my problem she's like hey look into this see how that plays into your problem or whatever um and I think that's the really valuable part of mentorship is that they can give you that big picture they have that big picture and can guide you to make revelations on your own and also just have slightly different perspectives on what you're doing and dealing with currently yeah thanks um, Daniel, it looked like you were going to jump in earlier. Did you want to talk yes. about your mentoring experience? Uh, yeah, so so I have somewhat of a different experience with both uh, mentorship and networking uh, because I, I started my business right after I graduated, the day after, literally. Um, I decided that was that was the plan for me and, and I pursued it. And so I didn't have any time to waste when it came to picking a mentor or networking or whatever, because I had, I didn't have a job, you know, I had to, to, to build this thing so that I could live. And uh, <laughs> it's, in doing so, I learned, you know, a couple of valuable things. And, and, and when it comes to mentorship in general, I think you really need to pick wisely and you need to find someone there's there's the the saying that is or what or what or whatever it is that says it, when you're when you start it says you don't know what you don't know and it's the most incredible notion to 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 realize that you're absolutely ignorant about a, a great number of things and so you need to find a mentor that knows those things and you need to read books to learn from other people's mistakes so that you don't commit them as well and and that's and that's how, sort of what, what I did in, in my start, because as I said, time was of the essence and the downside was, very, was extreme because I started, it was my own business. Um, and so that's what led me to, to find a mentor that, that I've been extremely lucky and blessed to have. He has his own style. You know, I think if, you, if your mentor happens to have a ton of free time, you should be very suspicious about that. You know, you need, you need to, Pick someone who's busy, who's out there, you know, in the field, you know, you know, doing it, not some charlatan with a lot of free time. Um, and when it comes to networking, what has worked for me, I am in the investment space. So I, met, you know, networking is a sort of an infinite dimension of that. But I've learned that the, the uh, inch wide mile deep works better than the opposite. You know, fewer relationships that are deeper and more profound in, in, in both a business sense and a personal sense have worked better for me. 
I have seen a lot of people, entrepreneurs and, and intrapreneurs, make the mistake of over networking, going to every single event and, and every cocktail thing and whatever, whatever. And it's honestly, I've seen it be completely a, a negative aspect of, of their careers. You know, I've seen them just waste time in, in that and in believing, uh, you know, the fallacy of, of that being productive in some cases. So, in, so that's what I mean. I, I have a little bit of a contrarian view about that. That is biased because of the way that my career, you know, start, you know, worked out. Yeah, but um, we have a lot of um, students who, who have entrepreneurial ambitions. So it's excellent. Really, that's fantastic. Good to hear about your experience, just launching into it right out of school. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Gilbert or Jimmy or Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with mentors, Jimmy? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I can jump in here. Um, so, I did have a mentor when I, I feel like I had multiple mentors when I was at, uh, at St. Edward's, uh, Dr. Single, you being one of them. Uh, and I think the other most notable was uh, Dr. Mike Harris when he was there as well. Um, I mean, and, and I know that's a little, I, I would say almost like non-traditional because, you know, you talk about like a mentor, it's it's somebody who is a little bit closer to you, you know, in age and those types of things who can kind of help you navigate um, your career. But I found the wealth of knowledge that both of you had to be extremely useful, um, you know, as as Callie kind of indicated and, you know, Daniel as well, just that guidance that you get, that that gut check from somebody who's been in the business, who has the experience. Um I think the other thing I would say is, is I do a lot of, you know, mentorship on a daily basis now um, with, you know, my, my position in my company, I'm associate director, I've got approximately 30 people who work underneath me in some way, shape or form. And, you know, we have a formal coaching program as a part of our, you know, employment and, you know, our, um, you know, our, our people first framework at, at Guidehouse. And that has, has, you know, it kind of forces you to be in, into that mentorship role. And so I think, you know, being a mentee has helped me be a better mentor, um, if, if that makes any sense, because, you know, you have to know or be able to take feedback and, you know, constructive feedback in order to be able to provide that constructive feedback. So I think whoever it is, whether it's, you know, a professor or somebody in the industry that you meet, you know, whoever it is, I would highly recommend getting a mentor it doesn't have to be a formal thing. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody. I, I like to tell, you know, my teams and anybody I talk to, my door is always open. I'm happy to share my experiences, however, you know, valuable or invaluable they may be. Um, so I would say find, find somebody like that who's willing to have an honest conversation with you, even if it's telling you something that you're not wanting to hear, or if it's, you know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. It's not always great news. So um, yeah, I have a, you know, great, uh, you know, great experience with being mentored. I am still mentored to this day. You know, my, my partner at the firm that I work for, I consider a mentor as well as, you know, several other people that, that I work very closely with uh, on a daily basis who, you know, are, are not direct reports or anything like that, but that I just have, you know, long withstanding professional relationships with. So I think it's, it's good to have, you know, at least one peer mentor, but, or one mentor, but as, as many as you can get across, you know, whether that be peers, you know, people in the industry, people in the business, um, you know, with, with that wealth of knowledge, I think the more you can have, the better, you know, obviously within reason, you don't want to be spending all of your time being because then you won't have any time to do anything else. So. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, the formal mentorship relationships, which I think a lot of um, organizations have um, in place, and they're certainly extremely helpful, but um, a lot of the research that's been done in the mentor area indicates that those informal relationships where you just click with someone um, are really some of the most effective. Um, so I think it's good for our students to think about um, taking advantage of those opportunities when they happen, when you feel like, oh, I have this connection with someone. Um, to keep pursuing that. Um, Jen, how about you? Um, maybe talk a little bit about your um, experience having a mentor or being a mentor, and then maybe um, talk about some advice for our students that might be uh, mentees of someone. How do you be a 
what's your advice for being a good mentee? Um, so I think everyone touched on like the importance of having mentors. So I will say um, being a mentee, keep in mind that you right now may be getting so, like, so much advice that you don't know what to do with it. You don't need to run with all of it. Like whatever sticks and resonates to you, that's going to stick naturally and listen to that. But uh, the flow of advice that you're going to get, especially like in the college age or in your 20s, you're, you're going to get a lot of it. And not all of it is necessarily right for you. Um, I learned that for sure. Like having to say no to even what my mom tells me I should be doing because everyone says I should be doing that, like choosing not to go to grad school right after I graduated. And that was a great decision for me. Like it's, it'll still be there if I want to, but you don't have to listen to everything everyone says, go with what resonates with you. Um, I did not have like an official mentor, but I did have meetings with different professors I looked up with. Um, the interim dean uh, previously, those conversations, I, I always remember parts of them that I still live by. So even though I did not have like a single mentor or went through a program, like I still found uh, different mentors in a more like, casual sense, I guess. Um, sometimes it's not even going to be career advice, but sometimes just personal advice of like how to take care of yourself as a human. Like I had um, my accounting professor tell me one time after class, we just had a long conversation and she was telling me, make sure you're having fun too. Like these are some of the best years, like a good, it's a great chapter, but don't overwork yourself. And I'm someone who likes to stretch myself thin <laughs> even now. I have to make sure like, go have fun with your friends, go enjoy those experiences. Don't just overwork yourself and miss out on like those important times, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said it was an accounting professor who told you to have fun. We don't always have that reputation. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about the rest of you, as far as advice for being a good mentee, what would you um, like to share with our, with our audience? Um, I have a couple of those, just really short. Uh, be, be very humble, have no pride, take everything and that, that, that comes towards you from this person. And as much as you can, try to provide value for your mentor. Try to do some, try to make an impact, have it to make a sort of a mutual transaction, a two-way thing. That's, that's what I have. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts on that, Gilbert? Yeah, I so I, I never really had a, a mentor either uh, in a formal capacity, I would say, but that's that does not mean that there aren't, when I look back, there aren't people that in some form or another provided meaningful guidance along the way. And to that point, in that theme, I, I recommend for all the students on the call to, you know, feel uh, empowered, have, have the courage to identify someone who you think is doing something that um, inspires you, motivates you, and, and feel free to just engage them and ask them questions, right? <clears throat> Maybe not establish that formal mentorship relationship, but, you know, just, just for that moment, just kind of hear them out. I mean, um, along the lines of networking and 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 just meeting people along the way uh there are different professors that i have conversations with that imparted me with some wisdom that i still you know carry on this day there are people that i worked with uh, i worked for in internships i worked for in previous companies um, that i've met uh traveling um, where we just kind of hit it off and talked about different things and i got exposed to just fresh ideas from different industries different roles and um, you know we're still um, you know, social media connected, right? So it's, and, 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 I, and I may revisit, revisit them along the way. And that's happened before uh, we go years without talking and I might have a very targeted question. And that's the best person that I feel I can, I can ask um, without feeling um, awkward, right? So 
I guess to the focus on the call is just, you know, uh, you'd be surprised if there's there's many people out there who are willing to just share kind of, uh, you know, best practices and what they've done um, and, and absolutely feel confident uh, to and, and, and don't feel insecure uh, to ask. Right. So that's that, that would be my advice. Thanks. And I think um, I find LinkedIn is a is a great tool for that. And it's always amazing who. Uh, sort of responds to different things that you post or um, I just had celebrated my 15 years working at St. Ed's and that, you know, it's on LinkedIn. And just, I was amazed at some of the people who, um, you know, just posted messages and things like, oh, that person's following me, great. So um, are there any other tools that any of you use for um, keeping connected with your networks besides LinkedIn? In terms of work, ones just the phone. Give give people a call. You know? Yeah, oh, that's old fashioned. <laughs> it goes very far. I know. I'm yeah. kidding. I think LinkedIn's done a really great job of monopolizing this whole area. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I do. I will say I, I do like Daniel's suggestion of of, of a phone call though, because like I I'm on LinkedIn. Don't get me wrong. So if anybody wants to find me, you can certainly find me. But I, there, there's something about it that's like a little bit informal to me. And so like, you know, a, a message to say, hey, I'd love to connect and, and you know, would love to chat with you. Like, I think goes a lot further than just like, a, hey, I want to connect on LinkedIn. So I guess I'm a little bit old fashioned in that sense, too, where I'd, I'd rather, you know, pick up the phone and call somebody. Obviously, if you don't know that person, you have to start somewhere. So that's a great starting point. But as much as you can, I think, yeah, that that face to face or over the phone interaction, at least for me, I think is, is much more valuable and, and shows at least a little bit more of like a commitment to like committing your time and effort to, you know, actually getting that feedback or, or making that introduction than just a, a quick connection on LinkedIn and calling it good from there. So I like the hybrid approach, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so very quickly, because I do want to give our audience a chance to ask um, all of you, their questions, but what advice would you give your 19 year old self? Jen, we'll start with you. Um, I, I would say like at 19, like it, it kind of goes back to, again, you're going to get like so many different people all over your family, your friends, whoever it may be giving you advice, stick to what's in your heart. Um, going to St. Edwards was not the choice that my mom wanted me to make because it, it was more expensive, but it has literally changed my life for the better. Um, also have fun. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I overwork myself, but I make sure I also enjoy the experiences in between. Um, really just follow your heart, like listen to what your passions are and keep following through with that. You are your own person. You are the only one experiencing your life. You will thrive if you keep working on what you truly enjoy. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Haley? Um, this is hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was similar to Jen in that I overextend myself regularly like, that was kind of just my status quo was to constantly just be moving 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 um so I wish I I guess I would tell myself to just like take in the smaller moments like don't stress as much about all of the big things that felt like they were constantly pressing in on me but probably could have been pushed off a little bit or not stressed about as much and just really enjoy um the present and how um things were going as they were happening um 19 was when I switched to publishing as my career and with that came a lot of pushback in that oh isn't publishing dying like you're not going to have a career when you graduate like there's nothing in publishing for you print is dead blah 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 um so I, I still made that switch but I was also having a lot of that negative talk that was surrounding me um which just like stressed me out to the max um and made me really overwork to try and make sure that I was as qualified as possible to have a job when I graduated in the publishing industry. Um, so I wish that I'd have just 
similar to what Jen had said, just kind of like filtered out some of that noise and just allowed myself to really exist in the moment. Um, do what I could at the time. Like, there's only so much you can control. So do what you can, get yourself set up, but also don't stress so much about what's coming so that you can't even focus and enjoy what's happening at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, that's great advice. I give myself that advice all the time too. <laughs> so I, I think that that pressure and, you know, is your whole life. You have to constantly remind yourself to be in the moment and enjoy that and not worry about what's happening tomorrow. Um, yeah. Let's see, who have we not? Um, Gilbert, what would you tell your 19 year old <clears throat> self? <laughs> yeah, geez. So uh, I would buy a whole bunch of Tesla stock. No, I, I, I think <laughs> at 19 years old, I, uh, Geez, I was probably right, a, a, a sophomore in college. Um, I, I really, I really don't have anything that comes to mind. I feel, I feel pretty um, fortunate, honestly, um, that along the way things kind of manifested in, in, in greatly for me. So, I, I would say I would though say that, that you never, you can never read too much, right? Just, just, uh, I, I feel like I probably should have learned more. Um, just seeing how how the world has changed in ten years, twelve years. Uh, there's some areas that I'm totally ignorant to um, that if I paid a little more attention here and there, um, I, I probably would have, uh, you know, just just sharpened my, my tool set a bit further. Um, in addition to that, uh, just keeping it very specific to the university, I didn't spend a lot of time in Austin, to be honest. I was there for school and I would I would go back home to Houston. I had some obligations there. I was working. Um, and And so most of my time. Um, my free time, I would say, I was not in Austin. And just seeing how rapidly the city has changed um, since I've graduated, since I've been 19 years old, it would have been very uh, beneficial, very neat to be part of a lot of the um, growth going on, um, you know, maybe have been more involved with some of the firms, some of the organizations, some of the people um, that, that were kind of driving a lot of this uh, uh, economic activity in the city. So I encourage the folks on the call, obviously, if you're in Austin, Texas, um, you know, absolutely do what you can to uh, to be part of what's going on right outside. Uh, this is becoming very much a vanguard city of, of all things new and digital and technology. And it's it's incredibly exciting. So uh, that, that, that that's what I would probably be, probably do differently. Yeah. OK, thank you, um, Jimmy. Stop procrastinating. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I say that jokingly because I, I still do it to this day, but like, I think the, uh, yeah, schedule management was a, a big thing for me as well, uh, when I was 19 and, you know, I think it's, uh, it's something that, you know, I, I think you obviously have to have, you know, and, and develop as you get into the job market. So I think learning that skill early on and, and being able to plan your own schedule and those types of things earlier on is, uh, very helpful, um. Also, I think it's, you know, I, you know, similar to what I think Daniel was just kind of touching on as well, you know, like things, things will always work out. So, you know, it's, you know, keep persevering. Don't, you know, don't, don't get, don't be too hard on yourself, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, things always have a way of working themselves out. You don't have to have all of the answers. You don't have to know exactly what you're going to do. I had no idea what I was doing at the age of 19. I had a general sense of uh, I had selected a major and, you know, I, I felt like I was doing pretty well with that. But, um, you know, you, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do. Like I, everybody on this call has taken a very different path. And I would say it's, it's worked out well for every single one of us. So there are plenty of paths and you just kind of have to find your, your own path and what works for you. Thanks. Have we had everybody give themselves their advice, Daniel? Yeah, I, I got a, a quick one. A quick uh-huh. one. Um, so, so this is going to sound very much on trend, and and it kind of is. But uh, the whole mental health subject, you know, is one that I would for sure give myself advice if I were 19 years old. Um, you know, we all went through an, the most severe period of uncertainty known. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, which is COVID, uh, as, a, as a business owner, it was extremely stressful and was taking a severe toll on 
on my mental health. It really was. I already had sort of an informal practice on meditation and, and all sorts of things. But if I were to give myself advice as, as a 19 year old and, and to people on this call, you know, the tools are out there. They're, they're scientifically backed. They're easy, you know, whatever. So get into it, but please, uh, you know, prioritize your mental health, your, your peace of mind, your ability to remain in the present and not get carried away by all the noise, you know, that is pursuing, you know, whatever it is that, you, that you're working on. Mm -hmm. So give yourself uh, the time to check in and to, to stay, uh, stay healthy in, in your mind. That's what I would say. Yeah, great. Because without that, you're not going to do nothing. anything else anyway. So exactly. So uh, I'd like to open it up to our audience members um, to ask questions. You can either um, just speak up or type it into the chat. Um, fire away. I have a question. Um, what is one class that you wish you did better in at your time at St. Ed's? I think you might have to call on somebody, Matt. Governmental accounting. <laughs> Sorry, I like just opened it up and didn't <laughs> ask anyone. I was like, okay, fire away. But yeah, whatever, I mean, whatever you want. I just graduated in May. And so I feel like I'm in that point of, I work at St. Ed's now, which is great, but I'm in that point of like, I still am around that academic world. So I'm like, oh my gosh, that class, like, I don't know why I didn't do this in that part. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm just wondering what your guys' thoughts are on that. Whatever you, whoever wants to answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with my original answer, government, governmental accounting, because interestingly enough, like I... I don't know, I, I guess as, as an accounting, you know, as, as a master's of accounting student, I was kind of like, oh, I guess I have to take this class and then, you know, go figure I'd turn out with a career providing consulting services, including accounting services and financial management services to government clients. So, um, yeah, a little bit, uh, I guess a little bit more attention in that class could have been paid to, uh, I guess, give me some, some better tools and, and skills for, you know, the, the on the job work. So. Seems like you managed okay, so. I think the, uh, what is it called? The quantitative uh, applications, basically quantitative the, Excel, methods or, yeah. the Excel class. <laughs> it's useful. I didn't know it as a freshman when I took it, but it's very useful. I just said calculus. It's the lowest grade that I got. And uh, if I could, if I could get a better grade in any class, it'd be the lowest one. It was definitely that one. I, uh, I let myself get beat by that class for sure. I'll echo that, but with pre-calculus, and I'm particularly bitter about it because I actually took that course my senior year of high school and got like a 98. And then I did it my spring or something of my freshman year and got a C. And I, I was really mad that I somehow managed to screw it up so badly when I had just taken that course and done really well. And then obviously college level pre-cal was on a different level or something. I don't know, but I'm a little bitter about it. That's <laughs> no class. Let it go. Let it go. At all. <laughs> yeah. The good news is once you're in the workforce for a little while, your GPA doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I don't use pre-cal at all. Like, no, it's not relevant to my world whatsoever. It's just, you know, one of those things. <laughs> Ariana, you have a, your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Um, hey, everybody. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, Kaylee. Um, I have a question. It's kind of um, personal, but I feel like everyone on the call might relate to it um, or just have some sort of advice at the same time. Um, I'm in the, I'm graduating in May and I'm in the middle of the job search and I just had the final round of interviews today and they asked me how I feel about the opportunity. And while I am really excited about the company, the role itself, I'm not very excited for. And this is like, it's like a great opportunity, great company. Um, this is my first interview 
um, my first like um, big opportunity, I guess. I have some other leads, but this is the, the first one. So I just wanted anybody's advice on whether to take the first opportunity that comes around um, or if you suggest it's worth the wait or just like how to navigate um, that uncertainty. Great question. That's a great question that is also very hard to answer. Um, I, I think my advice is if, if you're not in love with it, it, it's hard to like jump, jump into something and like actually dedicate like everything that you have to it and, and really try to be successful at it. So if, if you're not getting that vibe, I would continue to look. I think we are the one, I would say benefit of this pandemic is it is a very much an employee driven market right now. There are tons of opportunities out there and I think you can afford to be a little bit more selective. I think 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that was a very different story. So I would say take advantage of that right now and you know, see if there are some other opportunities. Like you said, this is just the first interview. You know, there are, there are plenty of opportunities out there. So I would, I would say go with your gut. And if, it, if your heart is telling you that it's not a role that you're going to you know, be excited about, be thrilled about and be able to dedicate you know, your whole self to, then I'd say it's probably not the right fit. Because I think you have to look at it from the employer's perspective as well. Like, are, are they going to get everything that they, they need to out of you as well? Um, so I think it, it, it becomes a little bit unfair on, on both sides if, if, if that's the situation that you're going to fall into. Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, to that? Off of that, I, would, I would say that um, it's important not to get hung up on the company so much um, as, as as more you should probably value the role um, and the people that you'll work with. Uh, obviously, it's the first meeting that you've had with the folks at that company, um, but you know, get to know them along the way. Maybe ask a lot of questions about the culture, about their working style. Um, that can really make or break uh, how you know your your attitude about working there. When I interviewed out of college. Um, I turned down some jobs because of that reason. Um, the other thing that I valued the highest was probably which role am I going to learn the most from? And um, that actually ended up being pretty valuable for me in the sense of uh, taking a job somewhere that wasn't maybe as glamorous, but I got to learn a lot more and was able to apply that pretty, pretty quickly to other places to get me kind of going in my career. So definitely, if you feel like you're not going to, you're not going to be challenged, you're not going to be simulated, you're not going to learn, uh, those will uh, probably get in the way of your growth and eventually result in a trajectory that you may not want for yourself. So just kind of think about that, I would say. Thanks. I, I like what they said. I would agree. Like if, no matter how cool the company seems like maybe it's a really cool big name that we all know but the role itself is not a fun role I I feel like when I graduated which was just a couple years ago I saw my friends and I all of us getting like these entry-level jobs and then a lot of people not everyone but there was like definitely a good like group that had like the same feelers they were not excited about their job they all had different jobs at different companies, but they were not excited because I think they took the entry level job that some companies offer. So if it's not something you're excited about, like, I don't want you to be one of those people who feel stuck at this company. And then you're going to end up looking for another job anyway, because you don't like your day-to-day -day tasks. Um, I always see a lot of cool job postings on LinkedIn. Um, so jobs will come, even if there's some not posted now, maybe in a few months or a few weeks, they will be. Um, and I like what Gilbert said, like, if you accept that job, it might put you on a completely different trajectory. Um, that happened with me. Like, I thought I was going to go into marketing. I'm a super creative, artistic person. I love doing that stuff. I took an IT role with Dell. And I'm on a completely different path. It's not a bad path, but if you're really passionate about what your major is or what career path you want to take and it's just not that just know that you might be steered away if this job becomes long term you know
So um, Aaron has typed a question into the chat. What are your long-term goals? Sorry, I just wanted to say thank you all oh. to everyone who answered. I really appreciate it. That helped a lot. Daniel, entrepreneurs always have plans for what's next. So what are your long-term goals? Man, I, I, unfortunately, a lot of my goals are outside of my work. Uh, <laughs> I, but but as, it, as, it, as it pertains to my work, definitely, you know, uh, continue growing. Uh, we, we managed to, to grow a lot during um, a tricky period, you know, and I think uh, it's, it's just to take benefit of the momentum that is kind of specific to Texas as it pertains to, you know, real estate and demographics change, demographic changes that are benefiting Texas as a whole and to, you know, grow the company as, as we have since, uh, 2015. Um, so yeah, uh, personally, other than that, I'm a, I'm a mountaineer, a rock and ice climber, skier, and I, I'm, I'd like to climb a lot of mountains and do a lot of stuff like that. But that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so my long-term goal when I entered publishing, I just I want to be part of the story creation process. I think it's a really important part of our world. I think literature has the ability to um, shape and capture capture the culture of the time, but also the culture that comes. Um, I think it's really, really powerful. So I want to, my long-term goal is to be an integral part of that, however that may be, whether it's continued in textbooks or whether I go into trade and work on fiction, um, however that plays out, I just, I want to be center in that process because I think that's one of the best parts of our world is books and words and how they can shape but also reflect our lives and the things that we're going through and um and whatnot um those are my it's a little vague but that's my long-term goal <laughs> Jen how about you me I don't know if I have a long-term goal I'll admit that I my number one goal in life is to just be happy and I think that's been a theme in a lot of what I say but I really mean that I mean I've had a tough past. I'm happy with where I'm at right now and I will hold on to my peace and happiness. And like career-wise, I like where I'm at right now. I have a great like career forward um, at Dell or you know, maybe there's like that creative side that might pull me in one day. Part of me, I don't have like a long-term goal plan but the overall thing is just to be happy and like stick true to who I am. But maybe I should make a long-term goal. That's <laughs> a good reminder. No, no pressure. You don't have to do that. Um, Gilbert? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think there's a gentleman, uh, Aaron, asked a question. Uh, just, I'm, I'm not going to share exactly what my goals are, but I think it's important around the topic of goal setting uh, to definitely get in the habit of, of setting something achievable, measurable. Uh, I, I tend to do the five-year goal thing. Uh, every five years, half decade, I kind of reassess what do I want to accomplish in the next five years. I think that's a good uh, metric. Um, it's, it's, it's an amalgam of professional, personal, and, you know, a little spiritual type stuff. But, uh, I think that's incredibly important. So as you guys get out of college, undergraduate, I imagine for the most part, you've been probably just focusing on, Hey, let me graduate, which is obviously a, a monumental achievement. Uh, so congratulations. But, uh, now that you don't have a very defined, uh, exit for your next four years, you're not, unless you're going to grad school or something like that. Uh, I would absolutely challenge each of you to to set, you know, a, a, a list of, of goals to accomplish by the time, you know, in the next five years, right? Um, and, and, and get in the habit of doing something like that. It, it's it's worked for me. I don't always hit them, but it gives me a North Star. It gives me something to kind of focus on and uh, motivates me. And how about you, Jimmy? 
I would pretty much second everything that Gilbert just said. Um, I will say, I, and, and Jen, I guess too, I'm, I'm not the best at setting long-term goals, but I find that by setting, you know, and, and I think it's, it's important not to only have like professional goals either. You, you have to have those personal goals. You have to have those, you know, anything outside of work, the mental, emotional, you know, physical goals, those types of things. Um, it, it just helps you be, you know, balanced. And so I think that is, that is my long-term goal, I guess, is to be balanced, um, to, to not overwork myself in any one category um, and, and be the best person, the best version of myself that I can be. I know that's kind of a vague answer and I hope everybody is striving for that, but um, yeah, I think, I think my, yeah, I think everybody's goals are a little bit personal to them. So, um, you know, like Gilbert said, I think the, the important part is setting those and, and helping, you know, give you that, that guidance to, to try to achieve those and give you some direction to your, your life in both professional and, and outside of your, your working career. Thanks. And um, any other what other questions do you all have? I have a question. Mm -hmm. What um, tasks or obstacles have you faced or do you face um, that challenge you and stretch you the most in your careers currently or, or previous as well? Oh, you're making them think now. I would say right now a challenge is this new environment we're in because of COVID. I work completely remotely as does the rest of our company. You don't want to become a shadow that no one knows you work there. Like you definitely need to still network even within your company, check in with people, even like people who aren't your coworkers, check in with your old classmates. Like I had um, a brother of mine in Delta Sigma Pi uh talk to me about their job at TikTok and we just like it, it was really cool catching up with them but don't let yourself be like stuck at home like even if you are at home you should definitely still put yourself out there in the ways that you can whether it's virtual or maybe there is an event that is safe and you can go yeah that's i think that's great advice jen i I'm always amazed. I tend to like to be a little bit insular. I'm an introvert, I guess. Um, but during COVID, I found that any time that I, you know, went to a social event, um, you know, even if we had to sit 10 feet apart from each other and outside and talk, it, the psychic energy I got after that was just amazing. And I mean, that still happens because we're still having to deal with all of that. I feel like the the one of the most challenging things that I have to deal with on a regular basis, and this is just part of my position and where I am right now, is is managing people. Um, everybody has their own personalities. Everybody comes to the table with you know different uh, you know different skill sets and those types of things. So it's you know managing and being an effective leader is is adapting my leadership style to you know, the, the people that I'm working with and the people that I'm, I'm, you know, trying to, to lead. So that to me is, is still challenging. I think it will continue to be challenging. Um, you know, and it, it's also, it's also hard because every, you know, everything's not always perfect, right? So you have to be able to give, have those difficult conversations and give people that constructive feedback. And that's not always comfortable. Uh, it never is, and it never gets easier. So um, I say that now as, as we're kind of right up on the, uh, we, we just wrapped up our year end performance assessments. And so, you know, there, there, there are some people and tough conversations that are going to have to happen and that's, that's never fun and never comfortable. So a lot of them are great, but there's always, always a few that are, are not, uh, not quite as much fun. So I think that's, you know, the, the more you can kind of practice those skills and, and develop those leadership skills, the, the more it will help you out, you know, the, the further on your career you get. I can kind of uh, relate off of that. Um, and that probably the biggest challenge on, I would say on a day-to-day -day basis right now is, um, and will continue to be just because it's the nature of this role. We're putting together a course with lots of different supplements and different elements in it and the textbook and everything. There's a lot of different vendors working on the different pieces of 
the course and a lot of them are dependent upon each other so like we have someone who's authoring the solutions manual or the powerpoints and then that has to be delivered to this other vendor so that they can be made accessible and then that has to happen and be delivered to another vendor so it's a lot of just managing companies essentially vendors people that we're working with um, within this process communicating deadlines needs expectations and then also putting it all together trying to get a course created in live and ready for students to use by the deadline that we set for the go live date that we communicated to sales that sales is communicating to the professors and students and things like that so for me like it's a pretty much daily struggle of oh this per this vendor is a day late and that day dominoes into two days and then three days and then four days and so it's just like there's a lot of um, dependencies and lots of people that were trying to wrangle to get this one thing created um so that's my daily struggle and it's just the way we manage it is lots and lots of communication trying to be very clear and what expectations are what needs are hard conversations where you're saying you're past deadline and up no longer okay and we need to fix it or there's this issue with this and we need to get it fixed as soon as possible and um that's been something i've had to really learn how to do is how to have tough conversations on a regular basis um not a confrontational person so that was something that i had to gear myself up to do so it's been a growth point for me the past few months um so that's probably my daily challenge or regular challenge that i have right now but i've gained a lot of skills out of it so <laughs> you know it's a growth period <laughs> Um, oh, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll make it quick. Um, for me, I, I think, you know, one of the most difficult things has been just working in this environment of, of, of complete, you know, surprises at every corner. You know, everything from hyperinflation to the weirdest employment dynamics, you know, ever. <laughs> and, um, you know, supply chain issues and prices of things being extremely volatile, et cetera. I mean, dealing with all these things which are um, which you're not familiar with and and then you have to run a business around and explain to people and all those sorts of things is 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 a major challenge. Um, I think you know some people, you know, particularly students may have the benefit of hindsight in a more you know educated form. It's going to be fascinating to read everything that comes out of this, you know, whenever this is more or less, you know, done. But but I think that that's a difficult part is, is figuring things out as you go and then working, you know, working through them, trying to, to be successful in, in that environment. Thanks, Daniel. Oh. Any, anything else you want to add to that? Um... Yeah. I'll, so Tracy, I think, I think uh, as far as challenging, um, and it's something that was is the same consistent challenge, which is in the corporate grind, especially with an operations and supply chain, is just the you know deadlines, um, balancing quality of work with you know the agility, right? You got to be very comfortable with with making a call, being very confident of uh, delivering a, a product or closing a project. Um, knowing that it won't always be 100% perfect, right? And and that's very challenging uh, because there's a lot of um, persuasiveness, persuasion that you you need to address with some of your stakeholders to to have them believe in, in what you're doing. Um, as as things change week by week, priorities change week by week. Um, it's it's important to have uh, confidence in your in your own ability um, uh, to to take those uh, you know ever changing. Um, operations, the nature of operations, um, and, 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 and take that head on. So I, that's something, Tracy, depending on what you do, if you go into an operations type of corporate world, um, absolutely, that will be a, a, a never present challenge, I think that you'll deal with. So just kind of, you know, be comfortable in that area. Thank you all.
Other questions? I have one for Daniel, um, but if anybody wants to answer, that'd be great. Daniel, you said um, it's important to provide value for your mentor. And I've tried to do that. I, I just say like, if there's anything I can help you with, please let me know. But I feel like I was like, what, what can I do for them? You know, like, I don't see how I can help. Um, so I'm just curious to learn or hear from you what that looks like. For sure. I, I identify with your problem so deeply because my mentor is a man that has everything basically and is extremely intelligent and definitely more intelligent than me. And so it's, 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 it's challenging to kind of imagine that you can even do anything, right? But sometimes it, it's not even like, for example, I focused on kind of for example, I focused on, a, on looking at his portfolio deeply, you know, because because his 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 holdings were so large that he didn't have enough time to look at you know particular line items as line items or variance things that are you know are worth mentioning or so it, it I had more of an enthusiasm and time for him so I could focus on on things that perhaps he didn't give himself the time to do anymore because he had bigger things to take care of yeah so I, that's something that I did but other than that you know don't underestimate you know the value that you can bring to a person in uh, you know just by being nice you know just by listening just by pr uh, showing them enthusiasm for 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 what they do and what they can uh teach you you know that goes a long a long way and make it genuine of course but um but I, those are sort of the things that i remember focusing uh on when i was starting now we've developed is we're actually partners now and in certain businesses and we, we're we have a, a deeper relationship thank you, you I, bet. Like kind of, I want to say well, one kind of just about... taking oh sorry no go ahead oh. go ahead go ahead sorry. <laughs> no go for it um i like that you mentioned just like show them your gratitude um uh, totally yeah I am in a place where like I have those casual mentors around me, but I also have people that I'm mentoring in my job. Passionate people love helping other passionate people. So if you're not into it, you know, you guys are probably not going to meet much, but if you are into it and you love the advice they're giving you, like let, let them know or let them feel that they're making that difference for you. Um, it'll build that stronger. And even getting the, you know, help and advice and mentorship uh, from other people. And it's been so impactful to me. It makes me love helping people. But again, it, we have to share that passion. I don't wanna give my, my love and energy to someone who is not going to take that gift. Yeah. So always, always show gratitude. Now, all I was gonna add was, I think it's helpful in a mentor relationship um, when you're the mentee to come in and communicate your goals clearly as, as much as you can like even if you don't have super defined goals just have an a general idea of what you're trying to achieve um, and what you what you're wanting to hopefully get from the relationship like what your goal is with the mentorship as well because if you I've found that when you go to somebody and you're like hey I'm interested in the things that you do and then like, what are they going to do with that? Like you need to pro help provide some structure into what you're looking for from them and what you're hoping to achieve just with yourself. Um, and then I also find it's helpful when I have my regular meetings with my mentor, I have a couple of questions, a couple of things that I'm dealing with, a couple of whatever. And I communicate those at the beginning of our conversation, like, this is what I'm dealing with, or this is what my workload looks like. And this is kind of where I'm having a sticking point. What are your thoughts? Or just things like that, just providing some structure so that the mentor isn't having to dedicate energy to having a session with you. Like, they should be there as a sounding board, as someone to talk to. Um, but I, I 
wouldn't want like I try to make sure they're not having to extend extra extra energy by basically creating a lesson plan or something like that like I try to a- approach all of my sessions with my mentor with a clear idea of what I'm hoping to talk about and discuss and often we end up going in different directions like something comes up and we go down a rabbit hole and that's fine but I, I think having some kind of structure or idea of the things that you'd like to talk about at least to start the conversation is really helpful and just to communicate your goal and be honest as well. It's not helpful if you're not honest with your mentor, um, which seems like it would be obvious, but I don't know that it actually is. Um, so yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we're at 7.59. Um, and so I want to uh, thank our audience for participating and asking some great questions. And I really wanna thank all of our panelists so much for giving up an hour and a half of your time to basically be mentors to the group of students that attended and and, um, share some really, really great advice. Um, So thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your evening. And um, Madison, I hope I'm not um, getting ahead of myself here, but um, she may follow up with your home addresses for the panelists to send some swag because we've got lots of swag for homecoming. And we'd love to send you some St. Edward's gear. So um, we'll follow up with you on that to thank you for, for being here. Good night, everybody. Thank you for having me. Good night. Good night. It was, it was a pleasure. You. Thank good you. Night. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you.